I've touched on arcades a few times in this podcast, but I thought it might be interesting to talk about what they mean to me, why I wanted to make a documentary about them, and what I think can be learned from them. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Daniel Boyd, William Hearn, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. The first arcade in your life is maybe not the biggest. It's probably not the best. But maybe it's the most important. So my most important arcade was the Dream Machine, located in the Duchess Mall and later the South Hills Mall in Dutchess County, New York. I went there in my preteen years, and travels to the mall are not overly interesting to a kid unless he has a place to go. And the arcade seemed incredibly inviting. And it was a multi-level room with maybe three dozen machines in it, scattered around and looked over by a very bored, very disinterested, low-paid person by the entrance. My arcade wasn't particularly dark. It wasn't a low-slung building. It was an open room that could have been used for almost any business. And the Dream Machine had primary colors on the wall, along with very large rails that looked like something out of a spaceship. Looking back at the period when I was playing at the Dream Machine, it kind of strikes me how every few months a new game would come out that completely changed what I thought a game could be. The Dream Machine is where I first saw Frogger and Pac-Man and Zaxxon and Centipede, all of these classic machines that we look back on were all coming in week after week, month after month at the Dream Machine. It was always a fight to get out there. I was just a kid after all. It wasn't very far, and my mother only took me when we were shopping. But I looked forward to it, and it was my number one stop when I was there. The Dream Machine existed at the peak of the arcade. I spent some time researching the history of the arcade, but there's been many other books that have come out about arcade history that would do the job much better than I could. But I will say that there is a definite trend that I clicked onto that made more sense. Uh, arcades, places of amusement, places where you would go in and a bunch of machines would amuse you, go back at least a century or more. It's just a matter of what kind of machines were there to amuse you. Whether they were skee-ball or pinball machines and then later video games. What happened, what made things different in the 1970s and 1980s were that video games were incredibly easy to maintain and incredibly profitable. If you had a machine that worked well, that was a hit, it could bring in hundreds of dollars just sitting there by itself. You'd have to fix parts that broke, of course, but in general, it was just a place that people came in and they dumped money into it. This meant that arcade machines and pinball machines could leave the bars, leave the restaurants, leave the seedy joints, and become self-contained game rooms. At that point, it just took people willing to put a few thousand dollars down and take on a relatively small amount of risk to make money. There's an entire class of business that the arcades are part of that's worth remembering. Currently, it's vape shops. Before that, it was nail salons. And way before that, it was video rental shops. And before that, it was these arcades. They're different than what we saw on seasides and in places where people would have entire rooms on boardwalks, uh, tourist traffic that guaranteed people who were new every single day, uh, getting cotton candy, eating terrible snacks, wearing bathing suits, and being willing to dump quarters into all these weird machines. We started to see them in towns that would never have known anything like this before. Somebody wanting to open up a business, 
in the kind of real estate that didn't have a sink, so it couldn't be a restaurant, and didn't have a back room, which limited it even further. This is how we got the neighborhood arcade. During this peak time of the fad arcade, I was lucky to visit a whole bunch of towns with my family and find them. They'd always be off the main road, they'd be hiding down some alley or side road or around a corner where the real estate was cheap. Sure, you'd have arcades where there were beautiful space themes or some sort of way to draw you in, but the fact is many of them could have just been holes in the wall with machines piled side to side so you couldn't even see the art, and then a whole bunch of people standing around pumping quarter after quarter into them with no regard for the noise that was blasting all around them. I loved these places because they were bright and beautiful and noisy and weird, and on trips with my family, finding the local arcade and just wandering around into the machines, seeing what was there, and wondering if there was something new I wanted to play, I could not think of a more fun way to spend the day. The modularity, the simplicity of a video game, of something like Pac-Man, where the game sells itself and you can wheel it into any direction in any sort of room, meant that there were places that I came to once in a while that seem, in retrospect, to have been almost fantastically impossible. At the Quasi Amusement Park in Connecticut, there was an IBM Family Day, which was IBM employees from all over the Northeast assembling on a rented amusement park. The rides were okay. It was a kind of park that didn't have huge thrill rides. It was mostly a smattering of carnival rides and then a lot of beer for the adults. But there was also a warehouse where they had filled it up with video games. It felt like a dump almost. They had every single game I'd ever known up and down these aisles. You see, all the games were set on free. It didn't matter which were the big names, which were the small names, because it was just another place for people at the park to stand at and think they had a great day. And since they were set free, Whoever was supplying the video games was more than happy to dump off every machine that hadn't made a big name elsewhere. Maybe it had a really small audience, or frankly, maybe it was busted beyond repair and could be used a little bit. But regardless, it was a wonderland that all these machines existed. I have a beautiful memory of going to Lake George, New York, a resort and vacation town if ever there was one. And there was a beautiful tree-lined street with all of these old buildings that had held all sorts of tourist businesses. And they were beautiful grand affairs, and some of them had been hollowed out into arcades. So you would walk into a room that was probably a tea room or a restaurant once, and it was just machine after machine among the columns and the beautiful flying buttresses. When I thought to shoot a documentary, I visited Lake George expecting to include these beautiful shots, and to my horror, everything was gone. The trees were no longer there. The buildings had been replaced by much more low-slung affairs. There was nothing, nothing of my childhood left. It shouldn't be shocking when everything that you were once part of is gone, but somehow it always still hits me when it happens. There are multiple reasons why there are no longer arcades like we remember. I have people contact me and wonder why we don't have arcades, why we don't have a neighborhood arcade in every town. The main reason is laws. During the huge scare in the 1980s about video games, a lot of towns decided to pass laws to make arcades effectively illegal. There's all sorts of definitions about what an arcade is. They rarely use the word arcade. They always talk about amusement devices and the amounts that you can have and what the square footage is and what requirements they are. But the goal is always the same, to get rid of the arcade, to make sure one of these doesn't happen. They were thought of as dens of iniquity where drugs and gangs would assemble. And so a lot of towns just banned them. 
Over the years, the rise of the boutique arcade or the bar arcade means that sometimes these laws have been overturned. People finally look back and say, why do we even have this law? Forgetting what things were like back then, that people were literally opening arcades anywhere they could with a really sketchy background. There was an arcade in Mount Kisco, New York I used to go to. It was right next to a mall, and, and it was a L-shaped arcade. So when you went in, you were looking down a whole bunch of machines placed haphazardly, and then at the end of the building, it would turn to the right, and there would be another cul-de-sac of machines. Drugs were definitely dealt. One of my friends always met his pot dealer there. And it was a place that could be unsafe to be in after dark. With the fall of the neighborhood arcade, the remaining places that had always been there in boardwalks and tourist areas wanted more and more complicated arcade machines to compete with home consoles and video games on your computer and, and later your phone. As a result, video games now, generally, are incredibly expensive. Anywhere between ten and thirty thousand dollars for one of these machines. They'll be breathtaking, they'll be ten feet high and be able to take four players at once, but they're not the kind of thing you can just shove one after another next to each other and hope for the best. They have to make money and make it fast, and if they don't, they're gone. If you see a boutique arcade now, one that shows up in your town, it's several things at once. It's probably a labor of love. The person who's doing it wants to capture something that's gone or wants to make something new that feels like the old days but has a whole new look upon it. Or it's a bar that wants to bring in people of my age who remember their teen years in the arcades of old. As a result, they'll have much better decoration, probably be cleaner, and definitely have pricing schemes like all you can play for $10 or setting them on free next to a bar that you're paying for drinks at. It's an entire other experience and it's very different from how it was in the 70s and the 80s. During the arcade documentary, I got to meet a number of people who were dealing with these machines in a contemporary fashion. In talking with these folks, I was talking to people who were self-selecting for being comfortable going on camera, talking about something that they cared about. There were a lot of people who were still, in some ways, in the professional arcade business, and I can tell you they had no interest in talking to me. I'd leave messages or send emails to folks who were in the distribution business, and there was nothing they wanted to say to me. The most striking and obvious theme as to why I got stonewalled on that was the influence of organized crime. It was everywhere I looked when I was doing this documentary. The fact that there were different families or syndicates involved in machine distribution back then and sort of now. Back in the early 90s, I had a business idea, the kind of business idea you come up with in your 20s, which was to get a bunch of vending machines and fill them with the sort of computer supplies you might need in a computer room and then put them outside the labs of various colleges and other locations. Uh, the idea being that if you needed a floppy disk or some pencils or other office supplies, you could go to this machine 24 hours a day and get the things you want out of them. Now, there's several reasons why that would have been difficult. Obviously, I would have been competing with the campus bookstore, and, and negotiating with colleges always would have been a problem. But the main reason I didn't keep pursuing it was a friend of mine whose father had run a distribution business in Rhode Island who said, do not do this. Please trust me on this. Organized crime will come into your life like a wrecking ball. You'll be visited, you'll be talked to, and you won't make any money at it. I took his advice, and Jason Scott, as vending machine mogul with a dark background and dark history, never happened. For the arcade documentary, what fascinated me the most was the aesthetic of darkness and solitary interaction with machines. I wanted to start out with the Mechanical Turk, 
I had a wonderful conversation with Tom Standage, who wrote a book about the Mechanical Turk, which was a chess-playing machine from hundreds of years ago, which people could not resist playing with. There's strings from the Mechanical Turk all the way through to music-playing machines and machines where you could rent a book that would open up and then close as your nickel ran out. And then from those self-playing mechanical devices all the way through to pinball machines, skee-ball, pool tables, and video games. Why do people love that place so much? Setting aside the business, setting aside the industry, why do people love these places so much? Why did I love these places so much? In my case, if I had to guess, it was the rules. The fact that there were clearly stated rules on each of these video games, if you put a quarter into Pac-Man, followed the directions, and then taught yourself how to play. The rules, the straightforwardness, the predictability of Pac-Man would give you a reward of being a winner. Every other part of your life could be falling apart, and, and when I was young, it felt like that. Between a divorce, moves, disinterest in school, conflicts with neighborhood bullies and people I didn't get along with and adults, video games were a predictable, fun, fascinating set of friends. In the modern era, where we have so many wonderful ways to look up the history of arcades, to look at photographs, to look at testimonials, and of course, to play emulated versions of these games, we have at our fingertips all the stories, the histories, the biographies that we could ever want. It took years for this to sort out, but my work at the Internet Archive ensured, with its all-consuming power, that I wouldn't have time to do the documentary I wanted. So I am sad that it never happened, but at least I know exactly why. As it stands, though, there is another documentary being worked on, called Arcadia, the land of arcades. And Zach, the director, was the person who put me in his previous movie, Viva Amiga. Zach has shown me footage from the Arcadia documentary, and I think it's fantastic. He is making the documentary I didn't, and I am so impressed by it. I moved the domain for my arcade documentary to his. So if you go to arcadedocumentary.com, you can see Zach's project. I couldn't tell you about its schedule, but I will tell you he is doing what I had hoped I was going to do, which was reach out to people for whom arcades were a part of their lives, ask them why it mattered, and then assemble it all into a project that's a joy to watch that you can then bounce from, find out about history you were part of, and also find out about history you were never a part of. As for the footage I did shoot for the arcade documentary, it's all up on the Internet Archive. It's all open licensed, and while I don't know if it'll ever end up in anybody's project, it's certainly there for them to take. So there we have it. Arcades were a part of my life, a part that I'll never forget. I'm so happy that my parents took me to the mall and I discovered the dream machine. And the whole part of my life ever since then, has been to return to the dream machine in my thoughts and in my memories. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to Forrest Fuqua, Mark Pilgrim, James Bekoyanu, and Scott McCready, along with the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. <laughs>